welcome. I'm Kathy Stanton. I'm the chair of the board of directors for Quabbin Harvest Co-op here in downtown Orange. And uh, we're one of the co-art organizers of this event. Um, and we want to welcome all of you and uh, into this beautiful space um, and welcome our legislators. We're excited that you're here. Um, and I just wanted to thank a couple of people uh, who are Brianna Druin, uh, who's at OIC and the launch space and Pat Larson from Guavin Harvest Co-op, who are the co-organizers who did a lot of the behind the scenes um, work. There's some food afterward, which is donated by, uh, or provided by Diamond Farm and the, um, the Corner Kitchen at uh, Trailhead and Nalini's Kitchen at Guavin Harvest, uh, all local, small local businesses. And that's what we're here to talk about, which is uh, local economic development and uh, workforce development in our area, in our, um, our struggling rural area, and that's you know we are we just had the Garlic and Arts Festival last weekend, which is always kind of the, the gathering of the tribes in a lot of way here, and it's amazing sort of check in to see the creativity and the the passion and the um, the tenacity of so many people in this area and what we've been able to to build and and create um, together. But then there's another side to living here, which is there's a lot of struggle and there's a lot of pain. Um, and it's, a, it's always a, um, a negotiating between those, those things. And I know that our legislators um, understand that, which is why it's wonderful to have you here for the conversation. So I'm not going to say too much. Um, what we're going to do is have them each speak briefly about some of what's going on. We'll start with Representative Susanna Whips, and then she will introduce the other two. Thank you. Every time I come to the OIC, I discover a new hallway that leads to something else. This is so fabulous. I've been around the building a few times and just seems like you're opening up new pieces all the time and it's really fabulous. Um, I'm so excited to talk about economic development today as it relates to rural communities. Um, just this week at the State House, Senator Gobi, Senator Comerford, and myself all participated in a briefing. Um, from Linda Dunleavy on our rural policy plan and it's it's a great comprehensive piece that was put together to make sure the rural communities have a voice make sure people know what we have out here earlier this week Senator Comerford and I met with um, Congressman Olver who gave an incredibly generous donation to Greenfield Community College to invest in our local creative economy and we had a great conversation about that. He mentioned the OIC, which he's heard about all the way out west from where he was and is looking forward to a tour, so we're gonna work on that. But um, I'm, I'm thrilled every day to work with these two ladies, Senator Comerford and Senator Gobi. Senator Gobi is, is the old gangster, I guess the OG of this, of this group here. The OG, you've been around a while. We're thrilled to have you. And, and the amount of institutional knowledge that Anne brings with her helps everybody as they come on board. And having, you know, just started my third term, having Anne be so gracious all of these years helping me out. And um, she's become a really great friend. And then Senator Comerford, her first year out, hit the ground running, got very active, isn't afraid to ask questions, and leans on the folks around her. So we make a really fabulous team, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. And more than us talking, we want to hear from you. We've got some great success stories. You know, what Sean Sahosky over in Athol has done with his team up in the Quabbin, um, in the North Quabbin Commons, and I see Lee Youngblood who's working hard to make sure that we're protecting a lot of open space. We've got so many wonderful things going on right now and to bring everybody together and talk about what's working for us and how we can grow this is really important. So I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce I think we're go to the Senator, oh. Senator <laughs> Gilby first, right. who's been a great friend of the region and a great friend to all of us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And I, I'm glad this is not any higher, because otherwise, what happens, you look like a pest dispenser, see? So this is good, this is good, there's no higher than that. And um, I'm glad you said institutional knowledge. Some people think I should be institutionalized, but that's okay. Um, I appreciate being invited here. Um, you know, Orange is not part of my district, but when things are good in Orange, things are good in the North Quabbin, right? And that's what this is about, to have an opportunity, uh, and working with Susie and working with Joe, to make sure that the entire region stays strong. 
Because when the region stays strong, families do well, individuals do well, everybody kind of thrives together. And it's been an exciting time. I know that Joe will probably talk a little bit more about it. Last night, we were at the State House about what, 9 o'clock or so, a little after 9. Uh, we were able to do the, the student, the, the education reform bill um, about 20, 27 years or so in the making. It's been a long time. It was 1993 since they had redone the formula. One big part of that that Joe and I had worked on, and we're very happy to see it, along with Adam Hines, is to make sure that there is a rural piece and to take a look at our schools, especially in our area, because we have a lot of declining enrollments and to make sure that that is being looked at and to figure out ways to equalize things and to bring equity to it. Joe was also very supportive. Um, regional school transportation was always one of my, my pet issues. And part of it is, you know, you think about in this town of Orange, it was Senator Maha who started, he was the father of regional schools. And when I spoke last night, um, they, they had me do a little interview before I was on um, in the Senate to, to speak. And the fellow entered, interviewing me, they had me sit in, in, in the um, kind of, a, there's a little reading room in the Senate, and on the wall is a picture of Horace Mann, and, and those of you in education know that Horace Mann was the father of public education. So as I was sitting there, I said to the, to the young man, I said, well, over my left shoulder should be a, a portrait of Senator Maha, which isn't there, because he was the father of regional schools. And you know, it's so important to make sure that our regional schools stay strong, and part of that is um, the transportation. Unfortunately, I took my lumps back last night, got beat down on that, but we're hoping in the supplemental budget very soon that we'll have an opportunity to put some money um, into that in the next couple of weeks to bring that up a little bit. One other thing I just wanted to mention real quick, this year I have um, the good fortune of being the chair of two committees, the Environment, Natural Resources, and Ag Committee, and our good buddy Bobby Curley, who's made sure if there's a trail to be had, he's found it. <laughs> He'll find a place to, to put a trail down, and we appreciate that. But I'm also, for the first time, the chair of the Higher Ed Committee. And one of the things that the Higher Ed Committee is doing, and we just started it last Friday, is that we're doing a tour of all 29, and Joe is my um, vice chair on that committee, we're, we're visiting all 29 state colleges and universities and community colleges. We kicked that off last Friday at, um, our, at MCLA, and then we went to Berkshire Community College. And to see the things that are happening, but, you know, you walk in those classrooms, and you see kids that are right from high school, and then you see kind of the non-traditional students. People are coming back for another career, and they're looking for things. And, and what's interesting is that they want to stay in the area. We know that, that the students that go to our community colleges that are at our state colleges and universities, they stay. But sometimes we've got to give them a reason to stay. And that's what you folks have been doing here, and it's extremely important. And so anything that we can do to sort of support that and work with you, and I'm looking forward to, to having some questions and some comments and figure out how we can make things stronger. So I appreciate um, being invited. Thank you, ladies, for allowing me into your territory tonight. And um, I'm looking forward to a good evening. Thank you. I'm back. Um, I am very pleased to um, introduce to you Joanne Comerford, you know, and obviously you saw a lot of, of what was happening outside, but you know what? It's good that we live in a country that people have an opportunity to express how they feel. And, you know, one thing in the job that we have, typically when we make a decision, we piss somebody else off. Excuse me for saying piss. Um, <laughs> but that's what happens, you know, sometimes, and, and as we try to work through things, um, you know, you have to listen, and Jo, jo is doing that. She's listening to, to what is happening and what is going on. And, you know, um, sometimes we sign on to bills, we do things, and nothing looks the same as it goes in as when it comes out the other end. It just doesn't. And so there's opportunities to always make things better. And Jo, in the short time that she's been in the Senate, has taken on a lot of difficult issues and is trying to do just that, to make things better for everyone and to look at things um, using our head and our heart. And so um, I'm very pleased to work side by side with Senator Comfort. Lovely, and thank you so much. Um, let me just say, uh, first, thank you to the organizers of tonight and this exquisite space. It feels just uplifting to be here with you. I'm really, really grateful. And if you were in the Senate chamber last night, to hear Ann Bobby throw down on regional school transportation. Not a person, really. 
and you know your leadership in school regional transportation and then regional transportation writ large, the RTAs, is unmatched. Uh, and last night, you, I think, hopefully, you made us all feel like the urgency was so significant. Unless we act, we are really derelict. Uh, so and put us all on notice. I'm, I was really proud to be with you in that. Um, but it was really beautiful. And 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 in terms of the rep here, uh, Rep Whips, I feel so grateful to be with Rep Whips. Uh, and we share towns together, and uh, there is no more fierce advocate as a representative and as a senator. Um, and, you know, folks talk about this all the time in Western Massachusetts. We just don't have the, the numbers of representatives and senators as the Eastern part does, so that what we have to do in order to be effective is we have to be each other's allies. We have to have each other's backs. We have to stand with each other in good times and in bad times uh, and lock arms. Um, and I feel like we do that in the region and um, we punch above our weight as a result. Uh, so Western Massachusetts was on the map because of these two uh, and their fierce commitment to this region, especially the North Quabbin. And I'm really proud and so glad to join you. Um, so, you know, uh, Anne started to talk about education um, and it was, a, I think, a historic, a generational step forward in education. The bill isn't perfect, um, and I think, you know, Anne talked about the one way that it's not perfect. It's not perfect with regard to regional transportation. We are still not keeping that promise. Uh, it's not perfect with regard, for example, to the burden of special education on schools. And I just want to shout out to Kathy, who's here, who for the town of Orange has been the most significant advocate. Um, <laughs> You know, this bill is good, but it doesn't capture two things. It doesn't capture the really significant special education uh, numbers that are in our public schools. Kathy's been sounding that alarm. It also doesn't capture the amount of time for educators to teach kids who hold IEPs. So there are two misses there. We tried last night, uh, and Anne was incredibly supportive. I had an amendment. It failed. Um, but like Anne, I, I'm not going down with that failure. I'll file it as legislation. And, and I'm going to do it as the orange bill uh, in Kathy's honor, Kathy's bill, because in fact that way um, we can keep the reality of our regional schools and North Quabbin schools at the center of that conversation. Another thing that we did, um, again, to strengthen the bill differently is we uh, looked at the impact of something called Proposition 2.5, uh, which is the way in which municipal municipalities raise taxes, and Kathy also sounded that alarm. Uh, in the ad in the adequacy of, on the legislature's part in terms of looking at the this now very old tax policy and the burden it's placing on municipalities and um, I will say that uh, seven of the highest tax uh, towns in the Commonwealth in the top 100 seven are in the top 20 uh, and they're in this district in the Hampshire Franklin Worcester district and that's because our communities are small but mighty they have an incredible commitment to our infrastructure and services. Uh, and we have, as, as my colleagues mentioned, um, you know, this, this desire but need to open up the kind of economic growth that's going to strengthen the tax base, bring in more money, and allow us to meet public education um, aspirations and requirements and also the kinds of aspirations uh, that communities have in terms of your own economic development. Um, so a couple of things I'll just put on the table like my colleagues did. Um, in terms of transportation, you know, all of us see transportation as, as one of the things that we have to get right. Again, Anne's been lead for the Senate. Anne's been leading that in terms of bus services, FRTA, PVTA funding. Um, Anne's thrown down mightily. We got that up a little bit more in a joint effort. It's not just us. We have some Worcester colleagues, too, who are with us. But really, it's the four West, five Western counties that are demanding regional equity. Right now, the MBTA gets $1.5 billion, that's B, dollars, um, our RTAs um, get 90 million, right? So 1.5 billion, 90 million, and the RTAs have a larger service area. And that's one of the ways that the, the Commonwealth tilts uh, toward Boston, right? And so that's why we have to tilt it back. Um, we've also been talking a lot about rail, uh, and in partnership with Anne and with Susie, I filed a bill on Route 2 rail. Uh, to study the Route 2 rail along this corridor. Many people in this room gave me that idea uh, because there was rail up until about 1968 running along. Now there's freight, passenger rail. Um, and so we got that done in the budget, uh, both sides. House and Senate, it takes both. Nothing happens in the budget unless we link arms. 
And so that'll be studied. Um, and so that's one piece of that, this interconnected rail work that's happening. Another is a north-south pilot that will stop in Greenfield and triple, essentially triple the service down and back to New York and Connecticut from our region. Again, transportation is a great unlocker for us. Um, uh, and Susanna also know very well the infrastructure uh, needs. I was really happy to join um, Susanna and Anne in welcoming Congressman McGovern. And we had a conversation in the region about economic development. Infrastructure needs uh, came up again and again, both water and roads and sewer. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing, again, as a Western delegation is we're going to hold a forum and talk and uh, bring in colleagues from the state and federal level and with case studies, like one from Orange, frankly, around water difficulties. Franzi is here in Montague, is, uh, is significantly uh, in need of water, sewer, infrastructure help. Uh, and the state and the federal government have to join hands. And we're lucky with Congressman McGovern as our guy um, and with two good senators. And so we're going to start to take on those. Because when we look at the rural policy plan um, that was mentioned, in fact, water, and infra water, sewer, roads, these, along with transportation, public, trans public transit, are some of the main burden or main worries for our small communities in terms of building out economic infrastructure. Um, and let me just say, I want to say one more thing. Oh, um, before coming here, I checked in with Eric Lesser, who's our colleague in Springfield in the Senate. Um, and Eric, so I asked Eric about the economic bond bill um, that's, you know, that we expect right on a regular cycle and an economic plan from the governor. Um, and so Eric actually said that he actually feels pr pretty hopeful about this year, and we can certainly go into more detail. Uh, but the governor will have a plan out, and how it goes is the governor puts a plan out uh, the Economic Development Committee, uh, of which Eric is one of the chairs, will hear that bill, they'll consider it, um, there'll be some uh, hearings on it as all public, uh, all public pieces of legislation or plans have a public hearing, such as it should be, um, so that they get aired and, as Anne said, considered deeply. Um, and then, in fact, this committee will write its own plan uh, for our region, and that's another way that we can be really good allies uh, for you, with you, in thinking about what the legislature can and should do for this region. Uh, but some of the focuses, just to go back to Anne's work and stellar work in the Public Education, Joint Committee on Public Education, they're looking in this economic um, development bill or plan from the governor at the, at the intense importance of community colleges, uh, Regina, from GCC. Uh, and you know we've got a stellar one in Franklin County that we can lean in on and that is really a beacon for us here in the Western region. They're also looking at ag and voc, um, so vocational work, which you know we think all the time about workforce development. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is that when uh, we were all at the plan unveiling, uh, we found out from Linda Dunlavey at um, FERCOG at the Franklin Regional Council of Governments that in these four Western counties, we have about 30% of the land mass in uh, the Commonwealth we have two workforce development centers. So this is over 2,000 miles and two workforce development centers. That's a major growing edge. Um, and so I'm really happy to see the Economic Development Bond Bill focusing on a major driver of training and um, expertise, like a community college, and then Voc and Ag, another major workforce development uh, source for us, and then workforce development itself, which is a, a key piece of this. So I'll stop there. So we got started a tad late, but we want to make sure we leave the full 30 minutes that we had set aside, which isn't enough for, I know, all the, the voices in this room, but to, um, to hear from you and to, um, to let the legislators speak. And I think, would you like to have them come up and sp they're okay to just speak from there? So we'll do a Q&A. I'll call on people, and then whoever wants to field it can do that. So somebody would like to jump in with a brief question.
we can't do the, the planning for a bridge in order to apply for the bridge grant. And I don't know if there's a way out of that cycle by which you know towns with a certain kind of economic trouble can get an actual grant for the planning, or what else can be done. But we're stuck. Yeah, I'm so thank you, Kathy, for raising that. And is anybody from Royalston here? My no. mom. Is from <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, Orange. I know Orange has been incredibly vocal on this issue, as has Royalston. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we go to Royalston soon. Yes, a um, couple weeks. Yep, yeah, and. Uh, one of the ideas that's been percolating that I have not yet shared with my colleagues is the way in which we could potentially join forces in this next budget to see if there's any way that, um, or you know, I'll just say just for myself, if, if there's any way to help bolster some of the regional planning agencies with a specific focus on this hurdle that you're articulating, which is, my God, we have to figure out what grants are out there with you um, and we have to actually help bridge the writing of the grant. Um, one of the things that, that the feedback that we got, I know you know this, uh, from Congressman McGovern's event that was, you know, I think a great piece of work on the congressman, which was, boy, it was pretty overwhelming, right? The, the information just came at us like this, um, and we need the, actually, we need someone who has expertise to go, oh, right, that's the agency, and that's the way you apply, and here are the things that is gonna help you get that grant. Um, and I'm really, I'm very sobered by uh, what towns are facing, just as you articulated it. And, you know, I'd love to keep digging in with you on that. I don't know whether you guys it want to talk didn't, about it. Um, oh, I don't know if it was you, Senator Gobi, that said years ago, which, again, your, your longevity there. <laughs> years ago, didn't DOT have their own engineers that would come out and help rather than a town going and it might have been before you. And that was something even somebody at DOT mentioned. You know, in the past, perhaps there had been somebody at DOT who actually did the engineering. So you're not pulling in an engineering firm, which is something we could look at. Also, um, the Lieutenant Governor um, several years ago started her community compact plan. And every town that signed up for it would have a better shot at grant funding. Well, guess how many towns are signed up for it? 351. <laughs> so we need something else. And one of the things that I've, I've been talking to some of my colleagues about a proposal where, uh, like a rural community collaboration grant, where a few communities that were having some of the same issues that needed services could maybe find a way to collaborate because they're always talking regionalization, how can you bring things together? So we've been kind of banging around and we, we meet, um, when I first um, came into the legislature in 2015, there used to be a rural caucus years and years ago and it had gone by the wayside and Senator Gobi and a couple of folks from the Cape and Adam Hines and a few other people revived that rural caucus. So it gives us an opportunity to get together and talk. But I think some sort of collaboration because the stories are the same. We, we don't go to a regional school and not hear about transportation and special needs funding and stuff like that. So how can we, you know, be best productive? And sometimes it's joining forces with somebody else. So that's some of the things that we talk about in our rural caucus. The, the only thing I, I was looking over at Glenn, the, and I want to thank you for the work that you do with uh, Montessori Regional Planning, because you know we we rely on our regional planning commissions quite a bit to do some of that work that you would, had mentioned. And the, there is a local technical assistance grant that has been I think you've made pretty good use of it, right, Glenn? And um, th that is a good one. That, that's the one that, there, that um, helps to do kind of those things that you mentioned. To do some planning. Question? Um, well, I think that Joe, Susanna, and Ann all know that I would first like to really thank the Senate for what they did yesterday. I, I think that they're not giving themselves the credit that is due. The Senate passed a $1.4 billion increase in education in our state. It's unprecedented, and it begins to make up for all of the problems that we have seen, transportation, education, ELL, low income funding for schools. Um, we have a ways to go, went through the Senate, needs to go through the House, we're hoping for Susie's support, and then to the governor, <laughs> another hurdle. But can you tell the community here what 
that type of bill means for towns like Orange, uh, you know, I know I'm part of Petersham, Athol, Royalston, who sort, I mean, we are looking at Wendell who faces closing, closing I mean, Warwick who faces closing a school. Will this kind of funding fix those, mis those wrongs? I guess is my question. So, I mean, it, it, it would be nice. It would be nice. I mean, the idea was to to um, make some changes to it, to do away with some of those large inequities that were there. Uh, there was a commission that was out a few years ago, Foundation Budget Review Commission, and there, that is the commission. They came forward with these various recommendations of what we should do. And that's really what the, the big part of this bill was, to, to fully um, implement those recommendations and to help each community. Is it going to? It's a seven year plan. You know, um, one of the problems is, you know, I'm not gonna tell you that it's gonna fix everything, because right now the economy's doing okay. We saw what happens, um, and it can happen very quickly, with things change with the economy, uh, interest rates change, you get into uh, a community that has declining enrollments, and I would like to say that for the next seven years, you're going to see growth, 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 and things are gonna be hunky-dory. We don't know, we don't know what the future is. We're hoping that part of what we did in this bill and that, that Susie will be doing, I would think, maybe in a few weeks, maybe? Yeah, not know. this Wednesday, I think the okay. following week. In a couple of weeks, is that to give a little stability, at least to give a little bit better planning for our communities so that they know a little bit more what to expect for funding. Uh, and I, I think that will be helpful because that helps with the, the other services in the communities. Because we know that our taxes don't just pay for schools. It, it, it's the police, it's the fire, it's our highway. It's everything, it's everything. And so the more that we can do to make sure that we're shoring up the education piece of it, the more money that's left available in communities to be spent on these other areas. So that's really part of what we're trying to do. And, and hopefully, and hopefully that, that, that's going to happen, that, that everyone um, will benefit. On paper, it absolutely looks like everybody's gonna benefit. In the reality, you know, not knowing from year to year what may happen, I'm not gonna tell you that, 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 that yeah, I, I, I don't think, um, you know, I'm not a soothsayer. You know, we can't make those kind of predictions. If everything, if we did a snapshot of today, and everything stayed as it is today for the next seven years, yes, people would do better, and continue to do better. Yeah. And what I can just build up on what Anna's saying, I love, I love how you just lay it out there. Um, I, I just want to say that the people, the really the victory um, belongs to the people in terms of that bill, right? I mean, like, I think we're all really happy to vote, you know, we're yep. happy to vote for it. This and is what a legislature, by the way. Yeah, you know, this, is, this is a legislature that cares deeply about education. Um, but I, I think we probably all would agree that it's people power that drives us forward, right? When constituents demand something like you did education reform, it is, it, you know, it just moves us to act. And there, I see our, our region um, embodied in so many sections of the bill. Um, so Anne talked about the four core tenets that were held up by the Foundation Budget Review Commission, which was more money for healthcare, um, more money for SPED, ELL, and districts that have disproportionate low income. And the low income is actually beautifully done, I believe, in the bill. Um, ELL is English oh, sorry, English sorry. Sorry. Thank you. A lot of yelling. Thank you. Don't let me do the alphabet soup. Um, and in the low income, it says, "Hey, if you're a kid, if you're a kid in a community, that is, if you're a kid in a household who's, that's disproportionately low income currently, and you live in Longmeadow um, or Wellesley, uh, it's going to take that community less money to educate you. But if you're a kid and you're in you're in, in a currently low income family and you're in a disproportionately low income community, you're going to need more money." Uh, because that's a, a community with systemic inequity, systemic poverty, and so in order to lift up that kid and educate that kid, we're gonna give more money. So it's a, it's a progressive, not in the lefty sense of progressive, but progressive in thinking that we're gonna go the distance on uh, low income. I'm really particularly proud of that. Um, and then I'll just shout out, anybody here from Gil Montague? Um, Gil Montague led the way, uh, in two, uh, for me anyway, my perspective, two ways, one is, um, oh, you're from Gil Montague. 
I'm sorry, Francie, I'm just looking right at you. Um, uh, Gil Montague led the way in two ways. One is uh, Superintendent Michael Sullivan really sounded the alarm and created this, this phrase, low and declining enrollment, um, which is a real significant issue for our region particularly. And of course, it's, it's not because people don't want to live in the most beautiful place in the Commonwealth. It's just that it, you know we the infrastructure woes we were talking about uh, broadband internet um, transportation right these are major challenges that we're all joining forces on but but Michael Sullivan and Gil Montague really said no you have to pay attention to this it's not classically rural um, and it's not a gateway city but it's something really different and we need some attention and so you'll see low and declining enrollment language all throughout the bill and I'm really proud of Gil Montague. And then you'll also see a, a passage in the bill that doesn't have any money attached to it, but I think it could be totally a game changer uh, for us. It actually is directing a study of how municipalities pay for schools. Um, there's a guy named Tupper Brown, he lives in Gill, he's a school committee member, um, and he has been yelling about this for as long as I can remember. And here's what's true. Currently, the way we pay for schools means that communities in Western Massachusetts pay a disproportionate amount. It, it's a, I could spend all day talking about the valuation formula and how that happens, but Tupper has been wanting us to look at this as a legislature and, uh, you know, rang all the alarm bells, came to meet with the education chairs, really weighed in along with all of you, I'm sure, in one way or another. Um, and that's in the bill. That study is going to happen, you know, once it passes and gets signed. And I think long term, that's going to be a game changer. And if I have my way, it'll just mean that the East, that is not paying its fair, it's what it, the full percentage of what it could pay. Um, we are paying 100. Most of our communities are paying 100 of what we can pay, or should, or told we should pay. The East is paying something like 15% or 20% or 25% in these super wealthy, highly densely populated cities and town. So I, I feel very positive about that. It's going to be like this little sleeper language, but I'm excited about it. Um, and I'm excited to watchdog it with these two. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that. Hi. And it's so good to see you guys here. Um, so I'm an artist and a designer. And I've asked, I am a blacksmith, and I've actually been asked to maybe design some courses for the makerspace. Um, and what you're talking about there is relevant to something I've got. And since you're on a higher ed committee, I, want to, I need to go back and get my graduate degree. I, I have a degree in fine arts from the top art school in the world, actually, Parsons School of Design. And at the time I graduated in 1983, I did not need a graduate degree to teach in higher ed, but now it's required. And so the um, uh, art graduate school is the, hot, the most expensive type of graduate school you can go to. It's like a $100,000 ride, usually. And it's with the least amount of income prospects. So what I am requesting is that we are allowed to do a self-directed master's program where we can get a credit. Because I teach design thinking and arts-based innovation, and there were no programs for that when I sort of became an evangelist for it in 2012. So I said, I'll just do it myself and I'll teach myself. And I probably know more now than any of the schools that are just starting now to provide, um, it's called integrated learning now in higher ed, but it's also called design thinking. So I've, I've run multiple workshops. I got sponsored during Paul Patrick's era to, to teach work, workshops in polio. And it's, it's mission critical for me because here's the other thing is that when I first moved to Wendell and I built my house with no mortgage, I moved here when I was 29 and I'm going to be 60 next year, I was paying $700 a year in taxes. But every year I could afford to put a couple thousand dollars towards my house. Now the taxes are half my income and growing and I want a fixed income. And there's this paywall between me and working at the incredibly competent level that I am capable of working at. And there's University Without Wealth at UMass. I've always gone to alternative schools. I already know what I want to write my thesis on. There's something called OpenMasters.org, which is a, 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 a path to a master's that I am madly in love with, but it's not accredited, right? And I, I am fully capable of doing this. 
And, and then I could make classes here. And right now we're in a climate crisis, and this could be all hands on deck. If you're attacking a climate problem, you know, why not compensate people for solving a problem? Because we have so many killer problems, right? So it might be part of your education, but at least let us be able to do that. There's, there's already pathways for doing it. So, you know, I can't pay anybody to do the plumbing. I have to do the plumbing, I stack the wood, I paint, I, I can't afford to hire anybody, and I can't afford to fix my house, never mind doing service to it anymore. So my capital is being robbed for me. And I've been living on ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year since nineteen ninety when I first moved here. I mean, the unfunded mandates of small towns are like as long as, long as your arm. And that's one thing, is that we should not be compelled to pay for unfunded mandates in, in tiny towns. So anyways, that's my heartfelt plea, is please let us just bootstrap our way to that, because 1.2, student loan debt right now is $1.2 trillion, so it exceeds credit card debt. And there's a wealth, a growing wealth divide, and I think that the cost of education has become a pain wall against, you know, upward mobility in poor towns. So and, it's, and it's going towards two million dollars. So that's, that's probably that's all I expect to hear. Yeah. 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 I mean, student debt. I have many friends who have kids here just getting out of college, and they basically have a mortgage payment without a house to show for it. I mean, that's that's how much some of them are paying on a monthly basis. Yeah. So, um, I I'm all for, I mean, I was a vocational ed teacher. I, I understand there's non-traditional ways to get a degree. I, I'd love to talk more. Um, I'm not that familiar with the accreditation, but I'm happy to talk with you about that and if that's something we can look into. But we need people willing to teach. And one of, just to piggyback on that, and recently I've had to have both a plumber and a, an electrician in my house. And they're older guys. They're, no offense to anybody in the room, but they're, they're mid to late 60s. And they're like, when I retire, there's nobody, there's no apprentices, there's nobody who's looking, you know, to go out and, and work with me. And that was something we've talked a lot about. How do we bring some apprentices on? And honestly, after going in, um, which I've taken a curve here, but I often do that. But after listening to these two men say how difficult it is to get apprentices, I went with my former legislative aide, Missy, and I went and we went to a recovery house and we're talking to some of the folks there and one of the guys was, you know, six months away from getting his master electrician license when he fell into some substance use issues and stuff like that and ended up incarcerated and now he's like, well, I'm out of jail now, but I, nobody's going to hire me to be an apprentice. And we were fortunate to connect him with somebody. But I think, I think there's a lot that can be done with regards to taking people with expertise and connecting them with people, especially non-traditional people who might be having a hard time finding somewhere to fit. But we need 20 years from now, we're going to need people to come to our homes and do our electrical work and do our plumbing work, and we need to start building our trades up a lot and making it attractive for somebody to go into a business and be an apprentice, as well as make that master who's teaching them, you know, compensate them for doing that and bringing up the next generation. But there's there's a big conversation to be had with regards to those who are looking to move up and those who are looking to lift people up and help them um, through apprenticeship programs and through teaching. And I think lifelong learning and buildings like this are an incredibly important part of that whole whole system we need to develop. I'm just saying because it took me 10 years to self-train myself, I should be able to get graduate credit for that. So, uh, do you want to speak to that? No. No. Well, she, did, well. she did very well. She did very well. Well, thank you. She did. You get the next one. <laughs> <laughs> she, the she said the next one. I'm talking to you, Ian. Oh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to be quiet. <laughs> I'm Bob Petrilli with Dr. Bob and the Trill Association. This, this is our headquarters. So I want to take a moment. In this space, four years ago, was a cement factory. I mean, it was blank. Alex over here, raise your hands. He's been in here. <laughs> he's been in the summertime. 
My trail name for the summer was Mr. Sparkles. I came in and I helped him out with the floors. But my contribution paled. Every, these tables were done by Alex. An amazing job. Bree drove me in, raise your hand. <laughs> Where are you, Bree? She stepped out. Bree, Bree along with six other co-directorships, took the bull by the horn and was an amazing partner with Alex to make this, this synergy work. And then to the, the third, you know I'm talking to you, Jack, over here, the Orange Innovation landowner, the mayor of this hospital. We came in here five years ago with the inception goal of the Q&M, and with the Feldmans this summer, it's now 250 miles. We have 42 overnight shelters. Um, so I'm glad you're all three here because we, we have been professionalizing the subcommittees and such. This 250 mile, it ties our whole region together, all our river basins. It's a very simple concept. It's based on the Appalachian Mountain Club's idea in the 1930s of from Maine to Georgia. And look how that turned out. The twist is the sociability and accessibility for all and right here at all this amazing training. We're bringing in the vets, we're tied in with the holistic communities, and they're all coming right here. This is a one, two, three, let's just get this thing open. There isn't a seven year plan. The seven year plan is done with. October 18th at the Brew Barn at Red Apple Farm, we're having a celebration of the trails. We're bringing in the mountain bikers, the equestrians, we're having a lot of music. It's going to be a whole gap. But we have our gatherings here every second Monday of the month. And they opened up the doors for us to have this happen. And it's happened. And we're going to be using this as our base of our headquarters. We've got the Allied Forces from Scotland, Highlands are coming in now with their veterans. A lot of things happening. I, I kind of what I'd like to do with you guys, while I have your all three attention, is, a, is getting not with you guys, but a subcommittee with a couple of my marketing and my finance people now to work with your staff and presenting the ideas of how this is going to actually come to life. We already have the New, the mountain, New England mountain bikers are coming at Red Apple Farm in May. 340 mountain bikers are coming in. We're setting up a 100 mile continuous track line so we can have national events here. And this trail is only one in three in the nation that can support that. But it's here now. And it's here because of this. It's here because of, it all ties together. Well, the outdoor, the outdoor trail, the outdoor trail, one thing about, I, I moved to Bearsden in an athlete. Because I threw like the 18, I, was, I worked at the Elder Bond program. And when I moved to Bearsden, I moved there because of Bearsden Conservation Area. The house needed a whole bunch of work. But I moved there because of that. And then to see our natural resources, that's why I, I, I cringe when I hear about the problems in our, our region. It's not. I've hiked PCT, the Continental Elder, all of them. Our natural resources in this area is spectacular. Our river basin after river basin after river basin and hills, so are you kidding me? With the Monadnock up here, Monadnock, we're heading by the way up to Mount Power to get to the Q to see after this. But the, the part of all this with your education is here we are right here with this education. So while you guys are doing what you're doing, start working, like I said, really work the marketing effort of what we have right here in each one of these rooms, get them out on the trail, Get them over to Blue Dragon Apothecary with, when they're feeling not feeling good. All the system of, of how to make somebody feel better. Opiates, everything is in place now because of this teamwork here. So, and like I said, October 18th, the Brew Bar in Phillipson, it's going to be a great time. So, thank you all. because the ecotourism we know is very big for the North Province specifically, and there's actually a bill in the legislature, it's in, in front of the Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture right now, that Adam Hines filed. We have a Department of Conservation and Recreation that takes care of our state parks, and what we're looking at is would it make sense that within that, to have another group that looked specifically on ecotourism, because it's such a big area, and, and, the, and DCR, with the things that they're dealing with, they don't really have time to do what you're talking about, Bobby, too, to work with the individual groups well, and we to work, try to find- We work with these, yeah. No, I know you did. Yeah. But one last time, I'm sorry yeah, to right. that, is the Tully Trail, worked with the DFW Water Trail Policy, Fred Hayes, after three years, we gotta save the Tully yeah. Trail. We're gonna build these stewards that Fred Hayes, 
the first joke that I've heard of this, and we have to be happy to sit down. Now, I, is this part of the regulations that they're doing with the, with the boards that are having meetings now on this? Because I didn't think it would have. I don't know where to go from. I think so. I didn't try to get Yeah. No, no. Please. This is something I noticed in the last three or four years they're doing locally, and I thought it was just a local issue at first that they were uh, pushing here in the town of Orange because we are so cash trapped. But I talked recently with the guy that farms my sister's land in Peter Sam. He uh, is from Hardwick. He's one of the biggest farmers down there. He farms land in Peter Sam, Mary, Hardwick, uh, New Braintree, probably other towns. And he was saying the same thing. I think he said he had 27 properties. He had to scramble this fall right when he was pushed the most to get cover crops in and get his crops off the land. And he had to scramble to uh, get his all the paperwork ready for all of these people and pay them for using their land. He said in some cases it wasn't even worth the profit that he made off their property. It wasn't worth it. He probably would wind up giving up those properties. Um, and I'm running into the same situation with a couple of small farms that I do. That I, have to pay people for the hay or whatever that I take off of their land, and the profit that I make on it is not doesn't even cover the cost of what I have to pay. But I'm keeping those that land open. Uh, it used to be just as simple as signing the Chapter 61 application, but now they want that the owners themselves to show a profit or show an income from the farm. It used to be that whoever released the land was they were fine with you just signing and saying that you had taken that much off of it. And uh, now they want the owners to do that, which a lot of the owners are, some of them are elderly people, they've inherited the land, maybe a woman inherits it from her husband, and she can't farm the land, she's never driven a tractor in her life. Um, so they've asked me to take care of it for them, and in exchange they have gotten the benefit of the taxes, and I've gotten the benefit of taking hay off. Now I've got to pay them to do the same. It's uh, just, it seems like it's pressure to me to get people off of Chapter 61. In fact, there was a letter from a regional assessor who pretty much stated that, that they felt that there were people that were cheating that didn't deserve this. Um, it's going to be a big problem for towns if all this land does go out of Chapter 61 because it's going to go into house lots eventually. And everybody knows that house lots are a net loss to a town but it's probably written that way, and they probably just not necessarily enforced it to that yeah, point. Right. So I think that's what it is. So they're enforcing something that they haven't really enforced before. But it's not written. It's written yeah. the land itself is what is yeah. not the landowner. So, land so we, you know, we, we will definitely we'll, we'll, we'll check with Mass Farm Bureau and we'll check with the you know the state yeah. assessors uh, association, maybe division of local services, and try to figure out what's really going on and if there needs to be some tweaking to the language. My guess though too is that because it, it, it does allow the local municipalities to have some control over that issue and so it, it's, a, they it's a bit of a... Uh, yeah, I, uh, they might say that, but... Uh, okay. And we've got three of us sitting here. We've got three of us sitting here and you know, we, we deal with farmers all the time. You know, I, I, and and they, we haven't heard this issue, so... Is there one about this to MDR's attention? But that's what we'll do. Right. Department of Agricultural Resources, John LeBeau or Ashley did it. We, I haven't yet. Yeah, no. we'll no, no, this is something that just came up yeah. last okay. week. I noticed the yeah. letters and everything. Okay. Chapter 60 wants us to do it. Yeah, we'll connect on this. I just yeah. want to give a little context to that, just talking yeah. about growing uh, local food. Like that. Right now we grow, I think it's about 10%, maybe if we're lucky, 5 to 10% of our own food. And there's a report by Harvard Forest that we want to increase to 50% local food in Massachusetts, which is where we were before the Second World War. We used to grow 50% of our own food. We have to triple the amount of farmland in production. So we can't afford to lose any acres when we have to triple what we have. Yeah. Thank you. success story that has come out of the, the state house is the Healthy Incentives Program, which people may know about, but that these three and a lot of other people fought to get um, almost full funding for this to um, 
subsidize people who are on SNAP so they get fresh fruit and vegetables at um, no cost to them, and it also supports the farmers who are then supplying. So our little store really benefits from that, so do the farmers, so do the eaters in the area. So six, $6.5 million that got put into the yes. budget and um, has let that program continue. So that's been really huge. And that's really, really thanks to the advocacy really around the Commonwealth. Right, in noisy is good. Squeaky wheels get the get the grease. Right, we, we, we want to pay attention to these things. Maybe Brad, what, one more question, and we'll move to kind of wrap up. Yeah, my question is the segue into. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm Brianna Drone. I'm the um, director of business development of the Orange Innovation Center, which Jack Duffy owns. He's sitting over there, and the co-founder of Launch Space, which we're all in, and I hope everybody sticks around Great for the tour. I introduced you, and you got a big clap. Oh, okay. Okay. I was, I was, I was, I was <laughs> stewardship uh, that we're, that is supports out east and of course in this in these rural areas we always talk about out east gets um, a lot of the bigger piece of the pie um, but we support them in uh, an economic way that they don't really recognize how can we all these people in this room and the constituents that support you um, how can we support you <laughs> Right, raising issues that we haven't heard of before, um, tuning us in to things, you know, when we're all here together and you see us nodding and writing notes, um, that supports us, right, because we want to do our work better, and doing our work better means listening deeply to you uh, and responding um, to the best of our ability on these issues. Um, I think we all value, you know, listening and engagement with constituents to the best of our ability. Um, so that's really important. Um, and then making your voices heard in the state house. The good thing about our region is, you know, we, we come down on uh, many issues on the close to the same side. We can get to some good common ground, especially when it comes to our towns and the well-being of economic development here. Um, and yet, uh, advocacy and public pressure, um, you know, sort of on lobby days, at hearings on bills that you think are very important. Hearing your voices in the state house shaping legislation is critical. Or sending in written testimony because it's a long drive, um, which we know about. We know a little about, um, and so that's that's also critical uh, because you help make sure and help us make sure that this narrative, the Western Mass narrative, the North Quabbin narrative, appears. And that's the, the that's what uh, Anne and Susie were leading long before I got there, which was is tuning us more into the North Quabbin toward rural, um, sort of using a rural lens. Um, I, I would have to imagine that, that that language is much more prevalent with this kind of power base that you guys have been building that I get to join now. Um, but you all doing that work is critical um, with us. I think being a cheerleader is super important. And, and for, for the region when you're out. But that's something, today I was at, I was at Manufacturing Day at the Sterrett Company. And when Leroy Sterrett was carrying his, the patent on the original meat chopper that he had created, that hasher that he made that was something I would never eat anything out of, but as he was riding on the train, heading to Greenfield where he was going to start his company, he started to speak with a man on the train and the guy looked at him and he said, I've got a manufacturing company in Apple, I can build that for you. And he got off the train in Apple, not in Greenfield. Wow. And this is just somebody having a conversation. One of the things that's incumbent upon all of us to do, and I know our friends are members of the chamber and people like that, when you're out, even five miles outside of this region, let somebody know where you're from and let them know what you're proud of in the region. And Bobby might talk trails and somebody else might talk about arts and the parts of the creative economy or jobs or where to buy a good set of tires. Don't mind your own business when it comes to our community. You've got to be out there. You've got to be a good cheerleader. And I think that's how we grow is just pulling people in. <laughs> So 